Good morning, everybody. Russ Barkley here. Uh, today, I want to talk about a, a very important subject, which is a continuation of another lecture of mine on driving risks in ADHD adults. First, as you can see, I'm wearing white, which must be, I guess it means I'm a virgin getting married, ha ha ha, or uh, I'm a doctor, or at least I play one on YouTube. But that said, let's take a look at a study that was just published this past week that I want to focus on specifically rather than put it in my weekend research reviews, because it's the first study I'm aware of to focus on driving risks among the elderly population with ADHD. Now, as you know from my other videos on driving risk in ADHD, most studies have focused on teens and young adults, typically adults below 30 to 35 years of age. Uh, there have been a few studies on those in midlife, but all of them demonstrate a significant increase in a variety of difficulties with driving and adverse outcomes, from difficulties operating the motor vehicle, such as steering, braking, reaction time, distractibility, and so on, <clears throat> to difficulties with traffic citations, getting more citations for parking, for speeding, for other problems. There's a higher crash risk among young people with ADHD, uh, such that we see them having at least twice or more the rate of crashes of other individuals. The crashes they have, as I've said, are often worse in terms of dollar damage done or in terms of bodily injuries. So uh, there's lots going on here with ADHD that makes it a very significant disorder to have when it comes to risks while driving. Uh, as you may know from the driving video I created earlier, uh, I lost my fraternal twin brother in a car crash that I believe was directly the result of his ADHD characteristics. But I don't want to dwell on the personal side of this. What I want to focus on is this study because there's a number of interesting things about this study. First of all, it was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association Network, JAMA Network, uh, and it focuses on older people who are 65 to 79 years of age and who have a diagnosis of adult ADHD. So let's get into the weeds here a little bit about this study because there are some, some I think, positive aspects to this study compared to other earlier driving studies. Uh, first of all, this study uh, focused on the elderly. That in and of itself is very unique. In fact, I think it's the only study I'm aware of, maybe you're aware of others, but that actually focuses on late life ADHD. Uh, the second thing is it found a prevalence of about 2.6% of ADHD among these individuals. That squares up nicely with earlier studies, not many, but earlier studies that suggest that there's a population prevalence of about 3% of ADHD among the elderly. That's what I certainly found when I did my US survey of adult ADHD symptoms back about 10 years ago. Uh, and others have since replicated those findings. So uh, again, the prevalence rate seems about right here. Why is it lower than it is in childhood or midlife? I mean, compared to childhood, which is about five to 8% ADHD, we're looking at less than half that rate. Uh, one is that some people with ADHD outgrow their symptoms. Uh, the second is that there's a developmental improvement in hyperactive symptoms, so that could cause a decline in prevalence, at least as measured by the diagnostic criteria. Uh, if we measure it by executive functioning, I don't think there's a decline in ADHD at all. The third possibility is, of course, increased mortality, which I talked about in another video on health outcomes. So there is a selective removal of more adults with ADHD from the population because of their risk-taking, accidents, injuries, suicides, homicides, uh, and just other health-related problems. Hence, the lower prevalence. But the prevalence here seems about right. What else is significant about this study? Well, it used a sample of more than 2,000 elderly adults. That, that's pretty cool. 2,832 drivers were studied in this. So this is a lot bigger than most other studies of driving tend to be, which means the results are probably going to be more reliable, more robust. Another significant thing about it is that they sampled 
these elderly adults from a variety of different geographic locations in the U.S., from Ann Arbor, Michigan, to Baltimore, Maryland, to Cooperstown, New York, and Denver, Colorado, San Diego, California, kind of sampling all over the U.S. And while it's not a completely representative sample, it's a lot better than just focusing on one sample derived at one medical center in one city. So uh, that's pretty, I think, useful as well. Again, suggesting the results are going to be a little more robust and reliable than other studies. Uh, I also like the fact that in this study, they took some objective measures of driving, probably using one of those driving monitors you can plug into your dashboard that some insurance companies will give you. And if you drive safely based on the data they get from measuring your driving, they might cut your rates. Well, they probably use something similar in this study because they measured events called hard braking which is a deceleration in the vehicle of greater than four tenths G. So uh, again, you're kind of measuring the fact that the individual was suddenly caught off guard by an event that was happening around them, either because they are distractible or because maybe uh, drivers in front of them were behaving badly too. Who knows? But hard braking was measured. They also looked at self-reported traffic tickets, citations, and so on, and at self-reported vehicular crashes uh, in this study. Now, the only thing I found that was a little, uh, I think, uh, questionable in the study is they didn't exactly assess these adults for ADHD. They simply asked them whether they had a prior diagnosis of ADHD uh, earlier in life or currently, uh, or whether they had been told by a physician that they probably did have ADHD, by a, a healthcare professional at least. Uh, so, you know, that's not exactly uh, the best way to go about assessing ADHD, but it'll do. The CDC has used it in their surveys. As you know, I've criticized them for that very lax definition of ADHD. But let's see what they found. First of all, as it says here, uh, and by the way, the sample was nearly half men and half women with an average age of about 71. As it says here, the lifetime prevalence again of ADHD was determined to be about 2.6%. They found that older drivers with ADHD had a significantly higher rate of hard braking events per thousand miles driven than did the control group. So there was an increase in hard braking. <clears throat> the second thing they found is that these adults reported a larger number of traffic citations, about two and a half times more citations, 22 and a half in the adult ADHD group on average versus about 9.7 in the control group that they used. Third, they also found that there was a higher rate of self-reported vehicular crashes, about double the crash rate in ADHD elderly than was seen in the typical population of the same age. So they go on to say that after adjusting for a variety of characteristics, they continue to find that ADHD was associated with about a 7% increase in hard braking, but a 102% increase in traffic tickets and a 74% increase in the risk of vehicular crashes. So this agrees very nicely with all of the earlier studies and extends those studies into the older population of people who are, uh, as I said, about, uh, what, 65 to 79 here in this study. Um, so these crash risks associated with ADHD as well as other adverse outcomes appear to be lifelong in association with adult ADHD. They're not just limited to the young, as you might expect. So the disorder continues to play an adverse role in driving outcomes, even into later life. Now, as you know from my other videos, <clears throat> we have substantial research showing that medications for ADHD, particularly the stimulants, are able to reduce these driving risks markedly in some studies uh, matching the rate of driving risk of typical people. That's pretty good, but at least they are significantly lower. Uh, we've tried driving education programs. Uh, I know that uh, the one study did a 
a uh, intervention with ADHD teens, took them through a driver training program using simulators uh, in hopes of improving the driving of these teens. Uh, they didn't get very far with that study in terms of, of much benefit from that. Uh, but that's what we would expect, wouldn't we? If ADHD is a performance disorder, not a knowledge disorder, then giving people more knowledge and more skills about driving isn't necessarily going to translate into changes in real-world driving behavior because they won't necessarily be using the knowledge and skills that we convey to them. So I don't hold out a lot of hope for driver training improving these difficulties. In my other video, we also talked about reducing distractions in the vehicle, turning off cell phones, blocking cell phone signals, uh, and also maybe using a graduated licensing system if we're talking about driving in young people so that they don't become independent drivers uh, as early as other people might. But I think of all of these, probably the cheapest, easiest, and most effective intervention is going to be taking medication while driving. So I hope you found this study interesting. I certainly did. It caught my attention when it was published just a few days ago. Uh, and I'll put the hot link in the a thumbnail sketch that goes with it in case you want to go read the abstract yourself. So thanks for tuning in, everybody. Again, if you like the information on this channel, please subscribe or recommend us to others. And I'll see you again in a few days with another video on uh, yet another topic related to ADHD. Thanks for joining me today, everybody. Be well.